um, this four farm case study came about um, because a couple of years running at Oxford Real Farming, representing Biodynamics, Biodynamic Association, Biodynamic Land Trust, I was being challenged by farmers and young people saying, oh, well, Biodynamics is all very well, but it's too idealistic and you can only make a living if you do care farming. It's not the real farming world. And uh, so when I made, made suggestions that for various places, they said, oh yeah, but that's a special case or whatever. So I thought we've got to do something about that. And um, bit by bit came up this idea that if we did uh, some case studies, some biodynamic research, uh, on four farms of different sizes, all of them Demeter certified, we'd be able to make a bit more of a clearly documented case that not only is biodynamic farming, it's also viable farming, and, um, it's, it's organic plus. So um, I put in an application for funding to the um, Anthroposophical Society uh, funds, and um, they were kind enough to support us. And I still haven't given a final report to them because thanks to the help of um, Julia at uh, the Agroecological Center at um, Coventry, thanks to Lawrence Smith, um, at, uh, who's now at the Royal Agricultural University, thanks to Janus, um, Bojan um, Jensen, who was a PH student of, of um, Julia's, who joined in at the time. And thanks to the farmers who put in for very few expenses, we've not yet used all the funds. And I'm hoping, I was planning in the springtime, that we could go out to the four farms and do a bit more, a bit of proper filming to add to this case study document. Anyway, with COVID, we've not been able to do that, but um, Julia and I really felt we wanted to share this case study again uh, with a wider public because we shared it with the Oxford Real Farming uh, Conference last January. We had a full room, but it wasn't a very big room. So we wanted to go on sharing it and various festivals we were hoping to share it at haven't happened, but we've not finished with it. So um, I like us to go on to the next slide and um, so that's just explaining a bit more about the objectives um, and how we chose the farms and I'd like to say a really very big thank you to these four farms um, of Loves Lane, Nanticleard, Plohatch and Yatesbury because I asked many many farms and many people said oh that sounds interesting I don't have time um, maybe next year, or I'm very sorry, really, really can't give the time for that sort of thing. So these four farms, farmers gave the time and it's been such a gift to work with them and really precious to have their help. And so now um, I'd like to hand over to Lawrence because it's with his help that we managed to get to use the pub public goods tool as a basic ground for our research. Lawrence. Great, thanks, Gabriel. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yep. <clears throat> That's great, thanks. So, um, yeah, I'm Lawrence Smith, so I uh, worked at the Organic Research Centre for about 10 years before I joined the Royal Agricultural University, where I am now. So, uh, I've um, been working on sustainability assessment methodologies uh, for most of my sort of research career over 12 years and um, hence my involvement here because we were looking to uh, apply a holistic sustainability assessment that I, I put together with uh, other researchers whilst based at ORC uh, and this uh, sustainability assessment was called the public goods tool uh, that was it was originally developed about 10 years ago with funding from DEFRA to evaluate how an individual farm performs across 11 areas of public goods that you can see on the left hand side of this slide 
and so uh, within the tool we um we reviewed the literature extensively and tested the tool on about 70 farms over about two or three years and continually refined it and it's um it's now become quite well established and being used on sort of nearly a thousand farms um as a a robust audit of how an individual farm is doing in terms of public goods delivery and of course this all um feeds into some of defra's thinking now around sort of public money for public goods uh, in the context of elms and the 25 year environment plan and so on but uh, in terms of this this project we wanted to look at how the public goods tool indicators related to the biodynamic approach and so you can see here that there was essentially a consolidation exercise where we were looking at how the different areas of public goods mapped across to the, so the five-fold areas within biodynamic farming practice. So we, some, of, some of them were easier than others in the sense of like soil management, for example, and animal welfare, there was direct mapping across. But in other cases, we, we had to make some high-level assumptions around what, what uh, was suitable and which... Uh, which pillar of the five-foldness. And um, this uh, allowed us to sort of compare the, uh, the uh, different farms to the sample that we'd produced originally within the public goods tool development project. So we could see how individual biodynamic farms, so case study farms, were comparing to this larger sample of farms that we'd assessed within the original public goods tool projects. And uh, that was the, uh, yeah, so that was a sort of consolidation phase, really. And then we also adapted the public goods tool to make it more relevant to biodynamics. So we included some additional questions that are not in your sort of standard PG tool audit that you can see here. So this, um, this was a, um, an add-on to the tool that was, uh, so these questions were asked by the researchers, sort of Yanis, the PhD student who was collecting the data. Uh, in most cases and he yeah he would ask additional things around how they're using the preps composting practice working with planets and the planting calendars and so on so um, this allowed us to have quite a sort of comprehensive overview of how the different farms were doing and um, on the next slide you can see um, we were able to see how the farms were doing across these 11 uh, categories that the public goods tool assesses and they this uh, spider web or radar diagram, as it's called, allows an individual farm to see how they're um, performing across these environmental, social, and economic areas. And um, later on, we'll show how the farms compare as well to the uh, original PG tool sample. But but it's the PG tool is quite a useful approach in allowing individual farms to see um, areas that could be improved and areas that are performing well and potentially to identify some trade-offs across these different social environmental and economic domains um, so yeah this is just a quick snapshot of the uh, the farms that are included case study farms and uh, now i think we'll pass over to the individual farmers who are participating uh, i'd just like to add my thanks as well to all the everyone who contributed but particularly to the farmers who were uh, very patient in terms of providing the quite detailed information that's needed. So, thanks. Rock, over to you. Please keep it concise. You have to unmute. Uh, uh, have I unmuted myself now? You have, that's super, Brock. Uh, hey, there we go. Hi, hi everybody. Uh, yeah, concise. Um, yeah, it's very, very interesting being involved in this. Um, it's been remarkably helpful. I, I kind of struggle with graphs and things, <laughs> but it, um, yeah, I, I guess there's some uh, markings that we've certainly improved by miles um, since doing it, bringing attention to. Um, yeah to certain aspects of your farm um the i think our food security and the, the energy use is massively reduced um yeah the fertilizer management's a, a challenging one i didn't i still haven't quite got my head around that one yet but um yeah um 
But in general, yeah, moving on and forward, it'd be really interesting to do it again. Um, I guess with any kind of computer kind of tool, it's how you learn to work with it also. So it's not just actually um, being, yeah, just having your farm assessed. I guess we get a really lovely picture of, of just a, a basic assessment with us just arriving at it. Um, but the, um, the, the, yeah, well, well, I guess once you begin to work with a tool and you learn how to use it and things, um, that might influence um, some of the decision making or, or how you present things. Mm -hmm. You know, when somebody's asking you, if you know how they're asking the question, you can answer it more in, in what they might be expecting, I guess you may be inclined to. Um, but yeah, yeah, we've really settled in since that and with, with the, the current um, global craziness, um, we've had a lot of time to kind of be in our space. And I think that's the, the big thing with the biodynamic farming is, is finding, yeah, I began with the rhythm of space, but it, it's, it's sense of space and, and finding a sense of space inside ourselves and then finding the sense of space by working with a particular space and beginning to feel how we fit into that and then seeing how they all fit together is I guess the journey of the biodynamic farm working our way all the way up to the to the whole country basically would be cool <laughs> but our yeah our community garden has grown massively since the since the thing um, we've now got about 15 to 20 families involved most of the time um, and we're providing vegetables for them um, so that's a big aspect that's changed um, we are now over 50 percent feeding our pigs from the farm uh, by reducing the amount we have and um, increasing um, what we're growing for them so that's really helped um, I think they're a thing that works fluctuation so it's good to like have a big explosion and have a lot and then slowly filter your way through them and, and reduce back and give everywhere a rest and that helps nicely um, but uh, yeah wor working with the with the tool has been really really um, uh, eye-opening really to, to, to bring about kind of parts of the business that I hadn't really considered um, yeah, and we're 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 quite a nice little um, block in the middle of quite a large amount of conventional farming. So we're an oasis in a way, which which is I, what I feel is our biggest role is to just be an oasis for access to land for people. And um, uh, yeah, access to land for everything, all, all the wildlife and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's feeling really good at the moment, and um, it's been nice to carry on inviting loads of people to come under the current constraints. Um, I, I kind of remarked myself as a bit of a an anarchist, I think, <laughs> although maybe be <a> anarchist. <laughs> So uh, yeah, we're we're there, and um, yeah, we're 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 fulfilling our role, and we're feeling really comfortable in it. In in the middle of people talking about how many tons per acre they're producing and things like that, we have let go of trying to compete, and we have begun to present ourselves in a whole new role of, of that we have uh, we have people who come. Who, who feel like they belong to the place and they, yeah, um, and, and the animals as well. So, um, yeah, we're, we're really feeling strength in our, in, in, in our role that we are playing, um, which is great. Thanks, Brock. You're That's very welcome. welcome. Yeah. Julia, are you going to talk to Nan Clid Farm? Um, yes, I can. Well, we're going to see a little video clip of Nan Clid. So Liz Findlay, Actually, it might be here. She is. No, a, I've yeah. looked, I haven't seen her. I've looked. Okay. She she was going to try and come in, but her connection's not very good. So, 
Uh, there's a couple of slides from Liz or about her farm and then she sent a, a very short uh, video clip as well but as you can see I'm just going to say for those anything in green is good on this di on the diagrams so you know if, if you're in the green you're really good and um, I have to say although we're going to see later on compared to conventional farms but conventional farms could often be in red in the center which isn't so good so these are all really good results that have come out even using this conventional assessment um, which we had to squash biodynamic farms into but that they still look really good so so this is Liz's farm and you can see she's got pretty you know you can see there's sort of harmony if, you know if there's a, a reasonable balance and then on on the the points that might go into the yellow you could see maybe where Liz is thinking about well what what's going on with her energy and carbon uh, but it's not a it's not a big deal but it kind of gives pointers and this can fluctuate each year and Gabriel you've got a, your hand yeah, up just regarding the energy and carbon two of the farms did not very well on that one and it's both of them because both of them have their farm over split sites and so they're using tractors to go not, uh, quite a few miles from one site to another rather than having one farm in a big block and I think that's what has done it for Liz here because she's got a big block right on the edge of the sea and then she's got another smaller block more inland and so that affects the energy rating. Yeah, thank you Gabriel. Yeah, and that's the same with another farm that you'll hear about. So Andre, can we go on to the next slide? And then this is just what Liz has been saying about uh, the benefits of working dynamically, connection to the rhythms, producing good foods and the site of using the preparations and then working with unseen forces and and then um liz has sent in some other some other comments about the public goods tool but they, those are included later on in this in this um <clears throat> this uh presentation so andre would you like to show the film clip instead that liz has sent in thank you it's not it's not loading i'll try again through the slides it's because a different format yeah i mean even, even it's only to, even hearing liz describe things is is okay it's just two minutes so yeah, it's all right did you hear it we could hear it. we had heard it before okay welcome to a day in the life of nankleed farm july 2020. i'm liz findley i farm with my son oliver on the west wales coast our compost system is at the heart of the farm. We add biodynamic preparations to our compost to, do, to create a diverse compost pile where the sum of the parts is greater than the whole. We grow mixed arable, seal scale veg, potatoes, carrots, weeds, kale, cabbages, onions, salads. Our fields receive the uh, 500 preparation early spring and autumn and the 501 in the summer. Tunnel crops include a mixture of strawberries and salads, tomatoes, aubergines, cucumbers, or for local sale. Hens live in 180 bird sheds and we make hay we have different age groups of birds on the hen and the farm uh, white leghorns, brown layers and different age groups of hens Different rations are milled for different age groups from day old chicks up to hens that are sometimes two and a half, three years old. Day old chicks are reared in the brooder shed where they're kept warm until they are 10, 12 weeks old. And then they move to the laying sheds.
eggs are stamped and packed daily. Thank you. Thank you, Andre, for showing that. And I think we can get a good idea or uh, some idea of, of what Liz is, it, it, where Liz is and what, what she's coping with. And I have to say that when I went there, it, it seemed to be just Liz running it with the help of her son. And you can see there's a very diverse range of operations going on there. And so she's doing a fantastic job. Um, so, so that's Liz and we'll hold her in, in this in this presentation as we go on to um, to uh, Richard. No, Nia, please. Oh, let me see, what's the next? Um, um, Nia, with the next? Uh, Paul Hatch. Uh, Paul Hatch then, sorry, Nia. Yes, hello, hello everybody. Uh, yes, thank you for um, inviting us to, to do this project. Uh, can we look at the second slide of Paul Hatch? I'd like to introduce it first, Andre. So uh, those of you who don't know, Paul Hatch Farm is a uh, is a community owned uh, farm. Uh, we farm at the moment around 400 acres, 200 on the main site and some um, uh, rented land uh, in the whole area um, all the way down to North Chile. So we're in Sussex all the way down to North Chile, which is about 10 miles away. Our main enterprise is a dairy herd that produces raw milk. And offshoot of that uh, is, is we get beef and we have pork that uh, helps us process some of the whey from cheese making. We got uh, sheep and lamb and wool and laying hens. We also got a 12 acre market garden and uh, everything is sold within our um, farm shop. And I think our idea is that we want to be a showcase that, that biodynamics work, that this model works, the model of the biodynamic mixed farm, of the biodynamic farm organism, works as, as something that is viable, that radiates to the environment and that is able to, to bring that health, um, that health chain that was talked about just when I was joined, which is a healthy soil makes healthy plants, makes healthy animals, make healthy people. Um, and we've got fantastic, uh, so far, you know, I think we're doing quite good. Um, yeah, so if we can go back to the slide of the results of the, uh, so we did the, this process. It was quite interesting because we are a community farm. We're not uh, one farmer who knows it all. So gathering the information was quite a challenge uh, it, because it, uh, th there's different enterprises and different people overlook different aspects of the farm. And the way we run ourselves, the way we manage the farm is a flat structure. So as a group, we manage it. Uh, which is an advantage and a disadvantage in this case. So we had a lot of people um, had to get involved in order to gather the information. Uh, it was also a bit more, uh, I found it personally quite challenging to fit the farm in a box, to fit to the different categories, to squeeze um, different bits, because I think biodynamic farms are quite unique. So trying to, to fit them into how um, the, the spreadsheet wanted it to fit, um, and so, so that was a challenge, but we got the results. We were quite, obviously quite, felt quite pleased with the results because we, we've got quite a lot of good things going around. Uh, yeah, our farm business, our resilience, our social capital is quite good. Um, and the, the place where I would have liked us and, uh, it was, was our energy in carbon. Uh, we are on a split site. 
So we do drive a lot. Uh, I think part of our issue with energy and carbon, uh, which is something that I've been personally trying to resolve, is the issue that we pasteurized. Uh, we, in order to, we don't pasteurize milk, but in order to um, process milk, we're heating a lot of milk uh, every day to make yogurt or to make cream or cheese. Uh, and that requires a lot of hot water. Uh, which is, is very energy intensive to heat. And we have had issues with trying to make, uh, make the, the system more sustainable in a sense that, again, we're not a f our system is not a system that you can take off the shelf and fit it into our dairy because of the demands that are needed, because of the way it works. So we have had quite a lot of engineers coming here, coming with different suggestions. So it's something definitely that we knew we needed to work with um yes but overall it gave us a great insight on on where we're standing and actually um uh, reinforced our feeling that you know we are able to to achieve what the, the biodynamic uh, mixed farm is about the farm organism is about it's about creating this, this kind of radiance of, of health and vitality that's it from plot farm thanks very much Nia. <laughs> Julia. Okay, and Sanak, go on to Yates Free House Farm and Richard Gantlett. Richard. Thank you. So we're delighted to be part of this work. Uh, we're working at a slightly larger scale than, than many others, which isn't good or bad, it's just different. And why, why are we so excited about being part of this project? Well, we like to challenge what we do to test uh, what we're good at and perhaps more importantly, what we're not so good at. And so we use a range of tools to do this and the PG tool has been a, a good one of these. And so you can see, as Julia mentioned, that, that where the line goes closer into the, the orange means we're not so good in those areas. And we worked with the PG tool over a, a long period actually and, and um, improved areas of the farm, uh, farm act. Outputs. We also use other tools. Uh, the B Corporation's Impact Assessment Tool is another interesting tool in, in a similar way this, that this is. And the Farm Business Survey, run by several UK universities, which compares the profitability of farms across the UK. And remembering, of course, that the, the first rule of sustainability is we have to make a profit to survive. On another level, 18 months ago, uh, I felt very defensive about our cattle. So our farm is, is as it says, uh, where we farm here is about 550 hectares and we're mostly cereals and we have a, a pedigree Angus suckler herd too. And so if you remember, there was a lot of talk about veganism and that cattle were, were bad for the planet and, and uh, people suggesting that they were a large contributor to climate change. I was sure their contribution to soil fertility was being ignored. And in the end, I thought I needed to do a carbon audit to see what the real situation was on, on the farm. And uh, next slide, please. So you can see the details on the farm carbon cutting toolkit, uh, of the farm carbon cutting toolkit uh, outcomes on our website. So if you search Yatesby House Farm, you'll see on our website uh, the, the actual outcomes. I haven't put them here because we don't have much time. But I started this process looking at the emissions and indeed most of the greenhouse gas emissions from our farm are from the cattle. So I looked at what we were doing to fix carbon on the farm and the field margins in the woodlands make a small contribution to fixing carbon. But that didn't make up for the emissions for the carbon. And there was only one section left to look at, it was the soil. And I did scratch my head for a bit and then I thought, well actually, fortunately in the 90s, when we were converting from conventional farming to organic farming, we took quite a few soil samples looking at the soil organic matter. And we've been able to compare how 
those fields look today. And we've been fixing about 0.25% organic matter, soil organic matter per annum. And that's actually a huge amount. And in the end, it means that we are fixing 10 times more carbon on our farm than we're emitting. And that was really a surprise, but exciting as well. So we're very excited about that. So all our work has come from a passion about the soil. And as I mentioned, you can check out more about what we do uh, by searching the HP House Farm. And you can follow us on Instagram if you like. We, we have an Instagram account, Yatesbury Farm, uh, which my sons uh, put fit pictures and, and comments up on. But everything comes from the soil. And the best way to protect it, well, I think it's by using your wallet, using your wallet wisely. And we've heard a little bit about, about that earlier. So every purchase we make sends a stronger message in my view, than any vote. So mine's a very short presentation, but thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, that was, yeah, that's really remarkable. And I hope you know, we'll be hearing from other farms doing something similar to see the similar results that, that you're getting. Um, so, so, so uh, Lawrence, uh, I think you wanted to uh, say something about this particular slide of comparing, uh, comparing with previous studies that you've been involved with. Thanks, Julie. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I just wanted to say, uh, so on the left-hand side of this image, you can see the uh, original uh, PG Tool pilot project that we, where we adapted the tool um, which was originally produced for uh, organic farms and applied it on 32 conventional farms so that's the picture on the left so so you can see um, the three lines on the spider web represent the average score across these 32 conventional farms in blue and then the range is presented there with the minimum and the maximum across these conventional systems and um, what we could see looking at the sort of conventional sample was that um, there were some categories where there wasn't much uh, variation, relatively speaking, across the, the indicators or the 11 categories, and others where there was quite, um, there was quite a vast difference across the, the farms, so like agricultural systems diversity on the bottom left. You can see there was quite a big difference across the, the sample. Uh, other things like animal health and welfare management that were more closely aligned and uh, of course looking at the the average score you'd see that overall there wasn't very good performance on things like agri-environmental management uh, compared to the farm business resilience which is on the left again uh, it's about 10 o'clock which is, relates to the sort of financial performance and uh, <clears throat> on the uh, at the bottom right, we've basically taken the same approach with the four biodynamic farms that we, we assessed in this project. And um, as you can see, the scores are, are much more closely aligned. Obviously, it's a much smaller sample, so you can't, you can't draw too much from this. But it's, nevertheless, it's interesting to see how the scores compare across the farms, particularly looking at the average the mean in the blue on the bottom right. When we look at this, we can see that the overall the biodynamic farmers were performing much better in terms of the agro-environmental management at 12 o'clock and the systems diversity and the social capital and the farm business resilience, which is on the left hand side of the spider web. So in particular, um, the agro-environmental management relates to what the farm is doing to uh, conserve rare species and to manage the landscape in a way that can promote, uh, it can promote greater uh, presence of endangered species, particularly red list species and how they're managing uh, things like hedgerows and pastures. And uh, also on the, um, so on the systems diversity, we were seeing this very good score, I think because of the, uh, the mixed nature of most biodynamic farms and uh, the diversity of operations 
we were seeing and the social capital again with strong emphasis on sort of farmers and organism and the interaction that, that encourages the local community in particular through things like csa community supported agriculture led to some very high scores uh, on the social side and likewise with the farm business resilience that um, presence of direct marketing so selling direct to the consumer through a farm shop say was again allowing for very good performance so so uh, yeah it's uh, overall it was a very high score for most most of the uh, categories that we were looking at um, some of the things that were slightly lower were around the energy and carbon perhaps a, an effect of having this very diverse mix of operations and the farmers near mentioned earlier being split across various sites and having lots of different things going on and including on farm processing um, yeah and uh, yeah the other areas that uh, sort of came out perhaps were uh, issues around the um, food security and the sourcing of feed from outside but overall it was a very good performance uh, from from all of the, uh, the farms compared to this conventional group that's helped us to provide a uh, to have a comparator for these biodynamic farms in this project. Thank, thank you, Lawrence. And I think um, you know one of the things was when we started this project, we were thinking, well, how can we assess um, biodynamic farms? Not in a competitive way, but just how do we explore what they're doing and the impacts. And we could have started from scratch developing our own methods, but we thought if we pick something that's already there off the shelf, like the public goods tool, it's already been tried and tested. And then we're not starting from scratch. And then as we use it, uh, we enter into the sort of organic farming and conventional farming environment because other farms and, and people have heard about this tool. And that's been the case that people have come up to us and said, oh, we hear you've been using the tool on biodynamic farms and they're interested in the results because they know about the tool. So sort of using this, this tool that's more widely available has, has been very helpful to us in that respect. Um, and it's also then allowed us to actually compare and maybe even compete because we're looking better. But, but it's given us a good starting point and then adapting this tool, although we couldn't use what some of the questions we've adapted in the final scores because would we wouldn't have been able to compare with previous otherwise. But, but you can see that the, our, that the four biodynamic farms, I know Lawrence, you know, you've pointed out it's only four, so it's a small sample, but it's a good start that they have, they do look really well uh, in their own rights and compared to a lot more um, organic and conventional farms. Um, we know they don't provide the full picture, that's why we needed to include extra questions and even then there's a lot of things that we couldn't capture, you know, and, and, these, and these are some of the reflections that all the four farmers, you know, yourselves have, have fed back that it didn't capture, you know, the, the, the need and, and the actual process of observation of integration, relationships and connection and caring for our planet because how do you quantify those? I mean the public goods tool is a spreadsheet um, and it works well for providing quantitative data, but not for qualitative aspects, which is half of our life and, and who we are. So we need to use sort of maybe social science tools and, and qualitative approaches to do that. And that comes in the form of case studies and, and interviews and, and things which, which we didn't do in the time we had. So we did also discuss uh, as a group, because we had a workshop after we'd visited farms, we'd had a, held a workshop to discuss the results and to look at, well, what else can we do? And, and we, had a, we had a prototype of a social impact tool, which is a bit like the public goods tool, but it looks at social impact. And we talked about that and the benefits of it. And I think we all thought it would be another really good tool. But the, but the uh, challenge there was that uh, the data's not been collected. I mean, that, you know, I know it was quite difficult sometimes, and Nia, you've alluded to trying to collect all the data to fit into the spreadsheet of the public goods tool. But a lot of that data was already being collected for DEFRA, you know, uh, requirements and things like that. So farms are already collecting quantitative data on yields, on all other things. But there, no one's forcing farms to collect a lot of social impact data anyway. So our farmers would have had to go out and do this all as a completely new venture 
so they didn't have that kind of data to hand um, which you know obviously in the future we'd like to explore but that, and that would be the case for any farm across the board conventional organic or or um or biodynamic is is that that social impact data isn't being you know it's not a defra requirement to collect things like that so so we'd need to do that separately uh i think it was brock or you know a couple of people have said it you know using this this um spreadsheet felt like squeezing a li living farm entity into a spreadsheet when it did feel like that for us as you know being on the research side we felt exactly the same really it, it, it um, crumpled it into something quite mechanical but but nevertheless, we can see that it has some benefits. Um, Andre, thank you. So then we talk, talked about how to better capture the whole farm benefits of biodynamic farming. And I mean, anyway, we wanted this to be a participatory approach and not an, a sort of old fashioned research approach where data is just gathered and taken away. So we've tried to have it at least to some steps towards participatory approaches. Uh, and that's been uh, the highlight, really, when people come to listen to these kinds of presentations, to have, you know, your, the four farmers you've heard of speaking themselves makes such a difference. Um, so co-develop approaches, more participatory approaches with farmers, use more qualitative and visual uh, approaches, maybe maps and stories, some of the Gertian inquiry approaches that Ruskin Mill has been training and demonstrating, um could very much help in this respect and what else could we be looking at i mean we've seen the whole range of 11 indicators and we had more um but you know more food quality nutritional values those are quantitative aspects that we could feed in uh, feed in uh and then diversity across the board so not just about biodiversity but diversity in terms of who's who's um who who's coming onto the farm or what groups of people uh, and uh, ev everything else as well and diversity in the non-physical realm as well and then um, you know we talked about um, the the way that biodynamic farming enables uh, plants animals and people to to express their natural behaviors and how would we uh, approach that and then also the other, other final thing and, and very importantly about you know the the, the our use of our intuition our gut feeling consciousness interacting with subtle forces and energies the unseen and how do we approach that so all those things we you know in this quite small and pilot project we you know these are sort of indications for ways forward that we could go in, in terms of further research and exploration with farmers with and with more farmers you know who, who will also provide solutions to those issues andre so so we've seen overall that you know each farm is unique and you know it's like a thumbprint and i think you know in in industrial agriculture it's tried to force every farm to be an act the same and uh, you know we want to go the opposite way and, and we've seen every farm is unique you can't you know it's difficult to compare really but what we also found in this project is it was very interesting for farmers to learn from each speak to and learn from each other i think you all felt it was useful to have a workshop where you could meet each other and interact uh hello liz i hear you're just here um so we'll you know just let me do this and then we'll see if you want to say anything um we know that farms did better even though it's a small number than the conventional comparisons tool um not capturing the whole benefits you know i think this is really just a, a summary of it um and we need to look about you know look forward how to how to or do we need to capture the spiritual worldview or what we can do is we can do research that looks at people's spiritual worldviews or um, and bigger picture frameworks in their lives and how that influences their farming practice. That is something that we could do in, in a research context, context in the future. Um, thank you. That was really just rounding up the conclusions. Liz, I, I don't know if you are, if you just want to say hi so that people know you're here because we've gone over your and there you are on the left there's liz in, in the photo liz would you like to say hello you need to unmute yeah sorry um yeah hi hi okay um you can hear me all right yes yeah okay good yeah thank you i wasn't going to say anything else okay okay that's fine <laughs> i know it's <laughs> Nice yeah, to hear. Well, well done. Fine, thank you. Yeah, well done for well, well yeah, done for that you. connection. And and if there, and I think we have we got Gabriel got time for any questions. 
I think that's yeah, for five minutes from Gabriel. So if anyone has any questions and knowing that Liz is also here, uh, we've got five minutes. Um, so would anyone like to put anything up in the chat box? Or speak, or speak if they're, you know, I think we're a smaller group now, so it might, I think it might work if people want to sort of say something. We're Can still I ask a question? Oh. Tech. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Um, can I ask uh, Lawrence, <coughs> hi Lawrence, um, can I ask you on your, on the, on your spider graphs, um, oh, sorry, what did you call them properly? Um, but that you, when you were talking about fertilizer management, I was surprised that the, there was quite a lot of, there wasn't a, there wasn't a tremendous amount of difference between the conventional uh, range and, uh, and the biodynamic a bit well i suppose quite a bit but compared to other extremes but that would be one area that where i would have thought there would have been a much bigger um so when you talk about fertilizer management can can you explain that a bit more for me or or, or is that something i should research independently outside of this meeting uh yeah sure thanks nice to see you again after. Yeah, hi. so uh, yeah so uh, fertilizer management it, the, in terms of the things that are scored in the PG tool, um, it relates to the farm gate NPK balance. So it looks at what's coming into the farm and what's leaving the farm uh, on a farm gate basis. So it's um, quite a simple sort of standardized approach that tends to be used by many agronomists out there. And it's just, it gives you a sort of high level overview in terms of how efficient the farm is according to those sort of three key nutrients. So it's, um, that's a big part of it, and the the other uh, the other elements of fertilizer management relate to things like um, how the uh, organic fertilizers being managed on the uh, biodynamic farms uh, and on the on the conventional sample. How often they're doing things like calibrating spreaders and whether they're using uh, advice from an accredited fertilizer advisor or if they're just it's just uh, sort of hoping for the best with application rates and things like this. So it's, um, I think it's fair to say within the, the PG tool, there's, there has been a tendency to get penalized for, um, for not doing some things that are sort of perceived by DEFRA and the, uh, the sort of conventional lobby, if you like, as being a, a good, good agronomic practice. So for example, um, using software like planet or a standard any other sort of standardized nutrient planning software gives you a better score in the public goods tool but obviously we know as practitioners that you know through observation um, and through knowing your soil well and through sort of through living and working on the farm on a daily basis you can get a to a very good understanding of how and how much to apply and when and where and so on um, and that's not really captured adequately, I would say, in the, or at all, hardly at all, really, I would say, in the public goods tool. So I think that might be part of the reason for the uh, slightly less good performance for some of the things within fertilizer management, in that um, some of the farms were not doing some of that uh, standard uh, or kind of conventionally, conventional wisdom based approach to nutrient planning, but instead perhaps relying more on observation uh, and. Um, yeah, I think it's fair to say that's a, a sort of an artifact of the tool, as it were, because it was a, a DEFRA project essentially that was coming very much from that sort of worldview, <laughs> that worldview, if you like. So, um, but uh, but having said that, I mean the score is still pretty good for <laughs> fertilizer management across the uh, the farms that we assessed, and um, you know it's heading it's in the green or sort of heading there, which is where you want to be really. So um, you know there is. There isn't uh, that much to say that needs to be improved. Okay. Can I come back? Uh, yeah, we'll just check. Has anyone else got another question? Otherwise, Martin has, will follow up. I can't see anyone. Okay, Martin. Um, well, okay. The, the, I suppose the, re the reason I asked was that my feeling generally is that fertilizer, conventional fertilizer, synthetic fertilizers, uh, their, their impact is generally underestimated. Um, 
with, with um, their consequence, with, with all of the environmental negative consequences from them. Um, so that's what surprised me. And uh, particularly, you probably all know there's a recent report come out just a few days ago, it's in Nature, uh, on nitrous oxide. And um, um, can I quickly say this? Yeah, uh, the anthropogenic proportion of nitrous oxide is 40%, the 60% is natural, and of that 40%, 50% is down to agriculture, and the highlight words were fertilizer uh, and something else. So, so it's kind of <coughs> the, the, the climate impact certainly is, is huge. Um, whereas um, I, I tell people who are farming more naturally, uh, genuinely naturally, which I'm just assuming biodynamic farmers are, um, one just naturally would think that their impact was far less and in fact possibly positive as well. Anyway, thank you. Thank, thank you, Martin. I think we're kind of more or less up to our time limit. So just want to thank everybody for... Just one more question, I think, from Alison oh. at Organical. Okay, I haven't seen that. Alison? Coming in at the last minute, and I haven't done so much homework because I've been very busy outside for months now. Um, but what I really need to ask is, this is so interesting and so time absorbing. Um, and I, time is the one thing I don't have much of because I have 151 acres to tend. Um, and it's all running away, <laughs> especially with all the wind, rain and extremely cold nights we've been having. But not to take your time anymore, I see that, um, Gabriel, you've answered my question, which is that the stuff has been around for months and I apologise, <laughs> I haven't had the time to look at it. But um, I do hope there will be a succinct point bullet points, look at this, look at that, look at the other, and you will find it here, there, and wherever. And I will do my best to catch up. Thank you. It's not a problem, Alison. It's just that we presented this work at Oxford Real Farming Conference last January. Yeah. And then we put the I would have come if I'd been able. <laughs> it's fine. We put the slides up, but that's why we're doing it again um, today, because not everybody well, has been aware of it and we want to share this so thank yeah. you for appreciating it yeah thank you <laughs> okay yeah, thank you Alison and also there will be a report the succinct report coming up as Gabriel said once the project closes with you know there's still money left in the pot so but there will be you know more dissemination of bullet point you know results and things like that and, and a follow-up hopefully as well so I just wanted to thank everybody involved in this especially uh, our farmers, Broccoli's, Richard and Nia and all their teams and also Lawrence and uh, it's obviously Gabriel got the money and um, from the Anthroposophical Society we also want to thank them for supporting this in the first place and, and, and that was fantastic that they've been able to do that.